you, buddy. <laughs> Love you, man. Well, good morning. It's a joy to be here and uh, uh, want to get right to the Word in just a second. Right to it in just a second. Revelation 5 is where we'll be. A couple of passions I want to briefly tell you about. Um, I believe that children need to be instructed in recognizing that there's a great big world outside of Pittsburgh, Kansas, and that the world needs Jesus, and we want to train our children to pray for the world to know Jesus. And so um, a cool little idea is uh, uh, you know, fidget spinners, all right? This is a BGMC fidget spinner, and if you don't know what that is, ask your children's pastor. But if, as parents, you would like your children to know how to pray for people around the world to meet Jesus, then get them a fidget spinner, like this one, BGMC fidget spinner. You can use any of them. But uh, this one, because while it's spinning, say, here, here's how we're going to pray for people in Malawi to meet Jesus. Or we're going to pray for the children in North Korea to come to Jesus and pray for a while while it's spinning. And if it's one of those that just go on and on and on, well, you may have to stop it. But anyway, I, I believe children need to understand that the world needs Jesus. Then quickly, one other thing. I believe that one of the most important aspects of us as uh, uh, adults is for us to know the Word of God, to be biblically literate. And so I want to challenge you to join me, not just reading the Bible, but actually learning the stories, knowing what it says. If we know what it says, we can live what it says. One of the most ignored books in the Bible is the last book. It's called the Book of the Revelation. And we're going to read from there this morning. And so if you don't mind standing, I'd like you to stand for while I read uh, Revelation chapter 5. So if you have a device and want to follow along, that'll be great. Revelation 5, starting with verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. This is a picture of what's happening in heaven, okay? This is what's happening in heaven. Uh, there's a lamb standing at the center of the throne encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out unto all the earth. And before you get real weirded out, this doesn't mean that Jesus has actual horns and he actually has seven eyes. This is metaphoric language pointing us to a lot of different truths about Jesus that we cannot unpack today. So it says, the Lord, the Lamb, had seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went, the Lamb, went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the four, 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. They weren't clumsy. They purposely went down before him like in an act of obeisance. Each one of the elders had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Verse 9. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them, all of these people from every tribe, language, people and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your scripture. Thank you that it is sufficient as a rule of life and godliness. Guide us as we think about what you have done and what you've made us a part of and what we can be a part of. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I've traveled Kansas for years now, and, and uh, if you've been anywhere besides Pittsburgh, you know that, that Kansas is pretty pasty white. 94% of Kansas is Anglo. So many people think of Kansas, and they think in terms of uh, just a backwater place in America that is kind of uh, monochromatic, but I'm telling you, the world is coming to Kansas. In Kansas City alone, in the city of Kansas City, Kansas, on the Kansas side, there are over 100 native languages spoken in Kansas City alone. When you can go to Dodge City, Kansas, and see women walking the streets of Dodge City in full burqa, you know that we're not in the Kansas that Dorothy and Toto were in when The Wizard of Oz was written. Kansas has changed. The scripture today 
tells us that Jesus has pulled from every tribe and nation. He's pulled into a body of people that we call the church. Now, we're sitting in a, a church house. We're sitting in a church building. And we, in our vernacular, we say, well, let's get around so we can go to church. Well, if you're the church, you can't go to church. You are the church. So you go to the church house. We are part of something that is bigger than just this body of believers. We are part of something that Jesus has built, that Jesus is very vested in. In the Greek city-states, so hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, their political approach to governing themselves in their city-states was to have times that they would call out all of the adults that were the adult males to come and deliberate on and make a decision about something in the life of their of their city and that group when they came from their houses and from their jobs and gathered in a certain place the greek language called that political gathering the ecclesia it meant those called out from what they were doing to participate in something else that was important and that it would have impact on everybody else around them so the writers of the New Testament co-opted that language and that concept. And so when we come to Jesus, when people interact with the love of Jesus and experience his presence and know what it is to become what John chapter 3 called being born again, when we experience that, we come out of darkness, out of sin, and we step into the marvelous light of a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So the ecclesia, the church, means the called out one. So if you're here as a follower of Jesus today, you are part of the church. And it's made up of people who speak Swahili. It's made up of people who speak English. It's made up of people from Izzard County, Arkansas. It's made up of people from Pittsburgh and Dodge and Elwood. It's, it's made up of people who have turned their eyes to him. Jesus has called us out of darkness and put us into something that he values i have figured out that if i value what he values my life will be improved if i don't value what jesus values my life will not be all that it could be so for the next few moments i want to talk about why i value the church why i value this this mystical group that is meeting all over the world in this hemisphere in the daylight and and just a few hours ago in africa and back further in china and india that the, the church gathers and and worships in the name of jesus why why does this church do what it does why do i value the church i value the church number one because jesus died to purchase her beth grant a missionary into india says be careful what you're willing to die for because you can only die once what will you give your life for? Jesus gave his life in order to create the church. In order to create, again, remember, not buildings. The first century, the people that followed Jesus, when they said church, they had no concept of meeting in buildings. They had a concept of a community of men and women and boys and girls who were devoted not to an idea, not to a theological construct, but devoted to a living, experiential Jesus who died and rose from the dead. So Jesus died to create the church, to create an entity that would be a representative of him on the earth. I hope that you and I will never allow this news of his sacrifice. I mean, I, I got saved when I was seven years old. I began to follow Jesus when I was seven years old. I've heard this a few times, a few times. Most of us, if you've been in church very much, you hear this. I'm saying to us, let's make sure that his sacrifice doesn't become white noise in our ears. The church is valuable because Jesus sacrificed his body on a cross and died a, an excruciating death so that human beings, 
people like us in Pittsburgh, Kansas today, so that we could interact with, intersect with, connect with God Almighty, the creator of the universe. So I value the church because Jesus died to purchase her. Second, I value the church because Jesus rose from the dead to provide a clear message of hope. Listen to the scripture out of Luke 24, verse 46 and 7. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead and, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Repentance for forgiveness of sin. Now, in our culture, there is quite a bit of pushback from any kind of conversation or any kind of speech from a platform it's often thought of as hate speech if we communicate that someone may be living in a way that is less than in alignment with what god's character looks like whatever they say we're not supposed to contradict we are called to give people good news the good news is not that we're sinners the good news is that jesus can save us in spite of us being sinners what is a sinner? What is a sinner? A sinner is a man or a woman, a boy or a girl. A sinner is someone who does not line up with the character of the creator of the universe. And when we are misaligned and are living in a broken way, not mirroring his character, when we're living like that, we can't fix ourselves. The Bible says that our very best efforts are like filthy rags before God and so he says since you can't save yourself I will make a way for you to have forgiveness of sins and so the church is valuable because our message says your life your past need not define what your future looks like so your addictions of yesterday need not define your tomorrows you can be forgiven set free from your darkness set free from the place of mis misalignment with god's character and made in unity now now listen i i know i know that that some of you are probably so holy that when you lay down at night you just levitate you don't even touch the bed you just yeah right me neither but i know this i'm a part of a group the church i'm a part of something that has experienced forgiveness i was in a mess and Jesus looked at me and he said, I love you like you are, but I love you too much to let you stay that way. And you can't fix yourself, but I can fix you. I'm telling you, dear friends, there is a Jesus that has built a church and he's building a church. We're a part of it. And our message is a message of hope. Our message is that Jesus raised from the dead so that we could communicate a hopeful message. Number three, I value the church. Why? Because Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to empower all of her parts. I, I grew up in the Assemblies of God. The Assemblies of God, uh, if you, Pastor Mark doesn't hesitate to tell you that FLAG is an acronym, Family Life Assembly of God. But if you, if you don't know what the Assemblies of God are and you hear the word Pentecostal and you have a bad taste in your mouth for some kind of theological reason that Pentecostals are like weird, then, then you're in a weird church today. This is a Pentecostal church. We believe that what the Holy Spirit was provided for on the earth, that it's still active today. The Holy Spirit's purpose has not changed for 2,000 years. And so Jesus sent his Holy Spirit not to make people act weird. He's not the Holy Spook. He's the Holy Spirit. And he sent his Holy Spirit. And listen, he is available. The Holy Spirit is available for everyone that has called on the name of the Lord Jesus who has submitted their life to him. The Holy Spirit wants to empower you and me so that we can be the best witness of Jesus possible. Not better than the guy down the street. Better than I am yesterday. That's what he wants to give us his Holy Spirit to do. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 said, Jesus said to his guys, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness if you're in a car wreck you see it you didn't participate but you saw it and the police say did you see what happened you say yeah I did you can say what you saw being a witness for Jesus by the power of the Spirit simply means that we are seeing Jesus active in our world and we're willing to tell people Jesus is doing something and it's wise to follow what he's doing so that's the church I value her because the church is empowered in all of her parts by this Jesus 
I value the church because Jesus promised to remain involved in building her. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He and his disciples had been walking along, and he says to them, who do the people say I am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, uh, you know, one of the prophets. And then he says, well, then who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And Peter blurts out, well, you're the Christ. You're the guy we've been waiting for for 2,000 years. You're the son of the living God. And they're standing here at this place that's, that was considered socially the gates of hell. It was a place where sacrifices historically had been made to the false god Pan. And so they're standing in front of this mammoth rock with this cave where sacrifices of children had been made to the god Pan. And so standing at the gates of hell, Jesus says, Peter, good job. Flesh and blood didn't give this to you. You didn't figure this out because you're so smart. He said, God revealed this to you. And he said, on this rock, now Peter means a small pebble. Like, you know, if you're walking along and you get a, a rock in your shoe, how irritating and, and painful that is. He basically says, Peter, that's what you are. You're like this little rock in my shoe. But upon this rock, Petra, meaning in the Greek, a huge immovable stone, on this rock I will build my church. So he's not saying I'll build my church on Peter. He's saying anybody that confesses, anyone that gets it, that Jesus is the one that was promised from eons past. He was promised and he is the sufficient source of all life. When you confess that, I can build on that. And I'm telling you, Jesus is still building his church. Did I mention to you that I'm not talking about the building? I know I did. So he's saying, I will build my people. I will build a group. I promise to remain involved in her development. You and I are not left to our own devices. Jesus is willing to construct us from the ground up. I value the church. A fifth reason that I value the church is that Jesus himself will return someday, literally and physically, to claim his church. Now, have you ever been walking through the grocery store and go to the checkout counter and you see those crazy magazines that, you know, describes, you know, woman gave birth to a seven pound werewolf. You know, anybody ever seen those? How many of you have never seen those? How many of you, no matter what I say, will not raise your hand? All right. That's what I thought. So when I say Jesus will come back, literally and physically to some that sounds like a ridiculous headline in some goofy magazine when i tell you that when that the apostle paul to the thessalonians said the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of god and the dead in Christ, those who we buried that follow Jesus, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up with them and meet the Lord in the air. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Paul says, we will all be changed in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And when I start telling churches that and remind them that there's a day coming that graves will burst open, and I'm not talking about zombies coming out and chasing people and eating their brains. That's not what I'm talking about. But dead people will get new bodies, and they will rise up. They will have eternal bodies. They will have heaven suits. If an astronaut's outside of the space capsule, they need a space suit. We need a heaven suit, and Jesus will give that. He's coming for his church. A few years ago, Karen and I were traveling across Kansas, and we got home one Sunday evening late, and when we went in the house, I said, wait, honey, stay out, because all of the cabinet doors were open. And all the drawers were open and I stepped in further and our back door was open and I realized we had been visited by a thief you know what they took you know what they took out of my house everything they wanted everything they, they left our dirty clothes when a thief comes they take what they want 
When Jesus comes back, he will take what he wants. What he wants are not pews and platforms. He wants human beings. He is coming because he loves his church and he is determined to have his church with him. It's said in John chapter 14, and this is so often read at funerals when we're standing committing the body of our loved one to the grave and we do all of that. And so often this is read at a grave or at a funeral. And Jesus, it says, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare it, I will come back and take you to be with me. We hear that at the funeral, but I'm wanting to have you here this morning that Jesus will come again. He has prepared a dwelling place. He's prepared a wonderful dwelling place for everyone that says yes to his lordship. Not everybody will get to live there. Only those he comes for. And he is coming for those who have said yes to his lordship and his leadership. I know that's a little bit exclusive, isn't it? But the Bible says those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I hope that you will call on the name of the Lord if you haven't already. So I value the church because Jesus will return and claim his church. And then the last thing, I value the church because Jesus will have her, the church, working beside him as he reigns on earth as king of kings. Doesn't matter to me whether you voted for Hillary or Mr. Trump. Doesn't matter to me if you're a registered Republican or if you're a registered socialist or communist. What I want to know is, are you following Jesus? Because the day will come that the United States Constitution is set aside. The day will come that the government of the U.S. will be null and void. The day will come that Great Britain no longer has a parliament. The day will come when Haiti will have no ruling class. The day will come when Jesus sets up shop on the earth and he reigns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, as Americans, we love to vote on everything, don't we? We, we well... We like to have the right. Most people don't vote, but, but we like to have the right anyway. When Jesus comes back, Jesus will function as king. You can vote on him if you want to, and you can vote against him if you want to. But it doesn't matter. When he comes, he will be the undisputed potentate of the worldwide existence. He will be the king of the globe. He is coming to rule and reign, but he won't do it by himself. The Bible said in Revelation 5 and verse 10, they will, we the church, will reign on earth with Jesus. I'm telling you, what you see now is not the end of the story. What you see happening in the Senate and in the judiciary and in the Congress and in the executive branch, it is not the end of the story. I don't know if there will be a wall built between Mexico and the United States. Whatever happens, it's not the end of the story. I don't know all that will happen politically, but I can tell you this with assurance. Jesus is coming back, and he's coming for his church. He's coming for people just like us that have bowed our knee to him, who have said, I can't fix me, AA can't fix me. I need someone bigger and stronger, someone more consistent, more loving, someone that has power beyond any human being. I need a Savior. You and I need a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior. Will you stand with me, please? Bow your heads for just a moment.